Triple C, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Glad you made it here today. I hope you've enjoyed previous podcasts. If you're new, well, welcome to the show. This is a site or a podcast, I guess we should say, that covers all things related to vertebrate pest management. So uh, I welcome feedback from you in terms of subjects that you may want to have covered. You can reach me at Wildlife Control Consultant at gmail.com that's wildlife control consultant at gmail.com i'd love to hear from you otherwise i'm just going to talk about what i'm interested in you can also visit us on the pest geek podcast page with facebook we hope you join us there and then of course you can also see my videos both on youtube and on rumble if for rumble just go to wildlife control consultant and my podcast will be listed there All right, well, last time we were together, I talked about the new EPA rodenticide proposal for changes to rodenticide labels within the United States. So the EPA, for those of you outside the country, is an environmental protection agency, and they obviously at the federal level manage uh, pesticide labeling within the United States, and they are a... They're making some major proposed changes here, and we went through them last time. So if you haven't heard those changes, well, then you certainly want to go back to part one because this is going to be part two. And not going to be quite as long as before, but definitely this is a two-parter. So in order to get full context, you probably should stop here, go back to part one, listen to that where I kind of summarize it. So let me pull up the publication for us here. So let's just go back to the beginning. Let's see, I'm on page, I think, 53 or so. And I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning just so that you can see what the title of it is. And let's read it together. It's the proposed interim registration review decision for seven anticoagulant rodenticides published by the EPA in November of 2022. Now, I'm recording on the 10th of December, but you're probably going to be hearing this sometime, uh, probably mid to late December by the time you hear this. So I've been going through this document, pointing out some of the rationale for the EPA in making these particular changes. I've made some criticisms and comments on some of those changes and then uh, noting that they're going to impact you and that the likelihood of these being implemented is rather high. The way I've talked about it before was the concrete isn't hard, but it's getting harder. And so uh, definitely made some comments in that regard. So you want to ch- check out my our previous presentation on that. So let's come down to this uh, to kind of get to where we... We're starting with before, and we've already discussed that. So let's, we talked about the respirator requirement. So here we go for the methods of application. So we talked about the PPE already in the previous podcast. So now we're into the fourth recommendation from the EPA in terms of making changes in terms of how anticoagulants are handled and used within the United States, and I would assume, excuse me, many of its territories. And so here was what they're recommending. And so they're recommending that for above ground applications of loose meal bait formulations of chlorofacinone and difacinone. All right, so let me stop there for a minute. A lot of you are going to be dealing, obviously, with structural applications like, what is this? We're putting rodenticides on the ground? And the answer is yes. For those of us in more agricultural environments, Difacinone and chlorofacinone, those are the active ingredients, those are first generation anticoagulants. There are labels that allow the use of those products on on the ground in agricultural settings. So typically they're used for the control of things like voles, that's with a V, and ground squirrels. And so often they would be broadcast methods 
or there would be something known as spot baiting. Spot baiting is where you go up to a burrow and you could simply apply this to the surface of the ground near the opening of the burrow so that when the ground squirrel comes out and feeds it. Now, chlorofacinone and difacinone also have an in burrow application and that's typically used for prairie dogs where those anticoagulants are placed down the burrow at least six inches. So that kind of gives you a little bit of a context here. Uh, typically for prairie dogs you're not allowed to do broadcasting and you're uh, you are allowed to do spot baiting and you can't use bait stations believe it or not with prairie dogs either at this present time so what they're saying is is that the chlorofacinone difacinone they're proposing that the applications can no longer be made directly to food or feed crops the application can only be made during the non-growth dormant period of the target crop. Now that may say, well, that makes a lot of sense. We don't want anticoagulants in our food system. And that's certainly true. However, like we have some cherry growers in the Northwest portion of the state that I live in. And if we're waiting for the dormant period, the ground squirrels are already in the ground. So how does that help? <laughs> so it, we can't use we can only use the spot baiting spot baiting is only going to work if the ground squirrels are out but if they're in hibernation when the trees are dormant what's the good of even if they're in a bait station what good is it they're not going to feed on it right so that's obviously it's a big problem and three the application is made along fence line border areas border strips so they are are allowing they are allowing control to be done continued along fence lines border areas buffer strips adjacent to target crops okay so due to these restrictions the epa is proposing to prohibit application to food or feed crops so that's big because there are some situations where rodenticides would be applied by airplane and that would also impact, of course, people using drones. So that would really shut down drone, the development of drone application. Uh, that's a problem because uh, drones give you some very targeted ability. Uh, so I would hope the EPA would reconsider that or at least modify it. And for below ground or in burrow use, the EPA is proposing that applications must be made below ground in the main run of the burrow. That's typically for pocket gophers. And the application can only be made during the non-growth dormant period of the target crop. Now, that's a significant change. So when we're dealing with pocket gophers, you can apply rodenticides. Right now, you can apply rodenticides in crop areas in a below-ground method. They're not worried. They weren't worried about the plant taking up the rodenticide. Now that's all changing. You can now only do it during the growth period. That is really going to put a hurt on things. And for applications made to non-bearing crops, EPA is proposing to add a restriction for harvesting food or feed from that crop within one year of application. So I would assume that is a non-harvest time. Now, one year is a long time, especially in areas where you have two crops per year that's been produced. So I, I don't know how this is going to... I don't know how this is going to play out here. I really, I really don't. So that's that's going to be a big, big change for our producers, uh, especially here in Montana, and I would assume elsewhere in the country as well. Well, let's keep going here because there's certainly more to say. Let's kind of scroll down to get to it. And what they're arguing here, I'm highlighting, again, this, if you're saying, boy, Stephen, this is awful choppy. Yes, I understand that, but I'm not having, the thing is 92 pages long, remember, and so I'm only trying to pull out some of the highlights. For above-ground applications to rangeland and pasture land, the EPA is proposing to prohibit spot, scatter, and broadcast applications. Now, I've already mentioned the spot baiting. We don't call it scatter, we call it spot baiting. So it's where you're putting a certain amount of rodenticide near the burrow. Or in broadcast, as you have maybe a um, spreader and you're putting the rodenticide in the spreader and you're just 
cruising along the landscape and spreading the rodenticide out into the field. They're looking to prohibit that in that the only above ground applications to rangeland, pasture land, fallow land may only be made using a tamper resistant bait station. That's going to be huge. So I'll be very interested in how they're interpreting this in relationship to prairie dogs. I don't have a good sense of how they're understanding this. Are they going to allow prairie dogs to be killed with um, bait stations? Because previously that was not the case. So I'll be interested in seeing how they how they work through some of these more finer or species specific nuances here. So I'm not exactly sure how that's going to play how that's going to play out. Another significant change, and I think, you know, in fairness to the EPA, I think this is a good one. I think this is an appropriate change. I don't think this is punitive. I don't think this is a big deal. Uh, I've been certainly encouraging people in my trainings to use the Bulletins Live 2 website. If you're not familiar with the Bulletins Live 2 website, let me kind of pull that out here. Uh, and let's go to Bulletins Live 2. This is the website created by the EPA to let you know if there's any endangered species restrictions in the particular area where you're looking to apply. And so here we have sort of a Google type map uh, and you would basically type in a location. So let's type in mine. I live in Lewistown, Montana, right? No secret there. Lewistown, Montana. And basically it Google Earth down to your location and it lets you know if there are any restrictions on the use of rodent on use of pesticides in that particular area. Now, obviously, if you're applying pesticides outside of the area listed here, well, then you have to move the map. Okay. So, and you say, well, this tells me that there's no restrictions anywhere in the in and around the city of Lewistown. Now, if you had a particular rodenticide or product that you wanted to check, you could simply type in the registration number right here and it would search only on that particular registration number. But right now there's no restrictions. And then you can just hit the printable button, hit that, and it allows you to print off a bulletin. Let me pull that up for you. And this is what you would attach to your pesticide label as proof that you have checked the bulletins live too. And so they're going to look into make this a requirement. I would suspect if not on all rodenticide packages, at least on those rodenticides that are used out in the field, I, they may even require it in the urban areas too. I, I don't know the answer to that. I haven't looked at things quite that closely to see. So, uh, but I would suspect it might be on everything. And this is to avoid confusion because sometimes they're no longer going to be listing all of the endangered species as it did before. And it did become a little tedious at times. Plus things are dynamic. Here in Montana, for instance, uh, grizzly bears are on the threatened, threatened list, but their populations are, are growing and they're, they're expanding their range in the state. So much for a threatened species, right? We have a grizzly bear now just north of us here in Lewistown where we didn't have one, you know, seven years ago. Okay, so they're up in the uh, Moccasin Mountains. And so we also think we have them in the Snowies now. It's probably certainly in the Little Belts. So they're expanding their range beyond the Rockies. And so this is becoming a significant issue. And so things are dynamic and changing to be sure. So I think that's a good change. But again, it's going to be, it's going to have to be something they're going to have to work around. But I don't see this particular change as necessarily punitive or inappropriate if I can say that and I and the reason why I want to balance this a little bit is I don't want people to think that everything the EPA does is wrong and and, and if that's your opinion then I, I would just have ask you to just reflect a little bit more deeply on the role of regulation in the country and so regulations have a, a positive role they're not always negative yeah they may be a hassle at times but when you think about the bigger picture, that the regulation's not there to make your life miserable, the regulation is there 
to protect some of the negative side effects of some of the things that we're doing. And it's trying to find that balance a little bit. And I think this is an appropriate change within that the EPA has proposed. And I, and I hope people don't oppose it uh, too much. Now, here's an answer to that earlier question. It says, Ex you will not be required to visit Bulletins Live 2 for those products registered solely for the use by the general consumer, which is probably an appropriate thing because the consumer probably won't visit it anyways, right? So it won't be a problem. Now, this is something that's going to be big, and that is the mandatory carcass search collection and disposal requirements are necessary for first-generation anticoagulant rodenticides classified as restricted-use products that are registered for use in fields and other non-structural-use sites. Now, that's what they've done in the past. So, for example, when you're doing, doing a prairie dog baiting with Rosol or Kaput, which is uh, chlorofacinone and difacinone, respectively, part of your obligation is on day four, following your application, is you need to start searching, doing grid searches for dead and dying prairie dogs. They are now going to make this a requirement for all field uses of these particular products. So it's not just going to be the prairie dogs, it's going to be everything. Before they would say, yeah, if you see one, if you see a ground squirrel dead and dying, yeah, go out and remove it. They're probably going to require these grid searches for everything using these particular products. That's going to be a major change. How they are going to enforce that, however, is another, is another question. So uh, I don't know. So here's what they are uh, suggesting. Search the application. Uh, EPA proposes adding the following mandatory post-application follow-up carcass search collection and disposal requirements to FGARs classified as RUPs that are registered for use in fields and other non-structural sites. So you structural guys are going to get away with it. You're going to dodge a bullet on this one, okay? But those of us in the field, agricultural settings, we don't. It says, search the application site and surrounding area to monitor the effects of treatment and to collect and dispose of dead carcasses of target pests and other non-target animals. Search the carcasses, search for carcasses four days after first application and at subsequent intervals of one to two days for at least two weeks after the last bait application or longer if the carcasses are still being found. Now for prairie dogs, what they're doing is that you have to do a search on day four, day six, day eight, day 10, day 12, day 14. If you're still seeing dead and dying prairie dogs, you have to do it on day 16. If you're still seeing it, you have to do it again on day 18. I believe, if I'm understanding this correctly, they're going to require something similar to that for even for the use on ground squirrels and probably voles as well. That's going to be a huge change. Okay, that's really going to ramp up the amount of work involved. And so it's basically pushing everyone into using zinc phosphide is what this is going to ultimately, ultimately do. You need to find the carcasses. If you find them, they have to be disposed of 18 inches below the ground surface, preferably deep, deeper. Use leak-proof plastic bags or other suitable containers for transporting carcasses not buried on site. So again, they're, this, they're treating this animal like it's a toxic bomb, basically. I mean, I think it's a little over the top here. Uh, but nevertheless, that's what the new requirements, that's what the new requirements are. So um, a little, little discouraged about, little, little discouraged about that. Post-application follow-up for spilled or kicked out bait. Now everyone's got to, they're really pushing on this, and this is certainly legitimate. And that is, while wearing gloves, dispose of leftover bait and any visible bait that has been moved from its placement location according to the pesticide disposal instructions. I think that's reasonable. We don't, if the purpose of a bait station obviously is to keep the bait secure. Same way when you're putting bait down a burrow, if the, if it gets kicked out, you need to put it back or remove it. I mean, that's, I think that's kind of a no, I think that's kind of a no brainer. Now here's the reporting requirement. This is going to be interesting to see how many people are actually doing this because there's a lot more 
dead animals on the surface. I mean, people always ask me, they'll say, well, Stephen, when I'm using this particular pesticide, how many animals are really going to be on the surface of the ground? Don't they die in their burrows? And the answer is yes. However, a surprising number of animals will die on the surface of the ground. They say, well, how, why am I not seeing them? Well, the reason is because there's a lot more scavengers on the environment than what you, than what you realize. So the EPA now is saying, you now have to report all dead or dying non-target animals must be reported to the EPA pesticide incident reporting system, and they give the URL as soon as possible. How many people are going to do that? I don't know. How many people are doing it now? Because some of the labels do require it. They're also requiring all dead or dying non-target animals should be reported to the EPA's pesticide incident reporting system. And this is for the FGAR and SGAR products for the consumers. So this is not just going to be done for the RUPs. This is also a requirement for the GUPs, which I think is fair. I, I, I commend them for that, but I really would wonder how much this is going to be done. And I really question how much, how many, how much reporting is going to occur there. Uh, the EPA has some information on some of the graphic issues. I'm not really going to talk about that per se. Uh, I'm not sure that's really relevant for us. But let's get down to this last section, and that is they're making additional requirements for each of the manufacturers of these particular pesticides. So the manufacturers are now going to be obligated to provide educational materials that describe the importance of protecting non-target organisms and BMPs, best management practices, to reduce potential rodenticide exposure to non-target non -target animals, including listed species. Now, whenever you hear the phrase listed species, that's referring to those animals that are either threatened or endangered under the Endangered Species Act. Materials must also describe label provisions intended to minimize potential exposure to the product. I'm going to move down to the page. Mammals, birds, reptiles, reptile, and amphibians that may be exposed to rodenticides through primary or secondary consumption, and it goes on. So now an additional burden is being placed on manufacturers. They now have to be basically kind of a training site for how to use their product more safely. Now, a lot of manufacturers have already started to do that, but this is certainly going to ratchet that up from an option to something that's mandatory. Uh, again, changes indeed are coming, and so it will be fascinating to see how all of this plays out. And then lastly, the importance of integrated pest management practices to control a rodenticide infestation. Let me, let me, I think I made a mistake here. Excuse me. Yeah, sorry I did. So let me, uh, so I, let me redo this again. So it's the minimized potential for product exposure to non-target organisms, including if applicable carcass search, collection, disposal, cleaning up spilled or kicked out bait, an overview of BLT, and incident reporting. I don't, I'd have to look up what BLT meant again. I forgot what that meant. Let me do a little quick search here. BLT. Oh, bulletins, the bulletins. Okay, so BLT, well, that makes sense. Overview of the bulletins, that's the EPA Bulletins Live 2 website for learning how to use, whether there's endangered and threatened species in the area, and incident reporting. They're also requiring the people, the manufacturers, to emphasize the importance of IPM to control inf rodent infestation not exclusive to inspection, sanitation, exclusion, mechanical control, and chemical control. And they need to have information on rodent biology. So this is going to be huge. So this is going to be certainly uh, a lot. So they're going to be a lot of information is going to have to be put out there now for the public to help them use these rodenticides better. So the EPA is, I guess, hoping, praying that education is going to change behavior here. And I think it will to some extent. How much? Will it be enough? 
I don't know. Well, that's basically all that I had for this particular presentation. So just to sort of summarize again what the EPA is changing, they're making all they're looking to make all SGARs, second generation anticoagulants, restricted use. They are going to make all first generation anticoagulant rodenticides sold in packages above four pounds restricted use. You're going to have to wear a respirator when you're using pelletized materials. You are going to have to uh, they're going to have additional information on documents regarding a bullet, Bulletin's Live 2. So now they're not going to have a list of all the endangered species. They're going to require you to go to the Bulletin's Live 2 for all products except those exclusively for structural homeowner use. They are also making restrictions on the use of anticoagulants, first gens, for field use kind of limiting the the ways you can use it in terms of broadcasting and certainly on crop areas and even in in burrow underground in crop areas is going to be restricted so that's going to be a major change of that and they're requiring manufacturers to add additional training information on their websites on the use of rodenticides and so Again, these are significant, uh, some of these are significant changes. I do think, to repeat, the Bulletin's Live 2 is a positive change, and I do think that's going to make things a little bit easier. It's certainly going to shrink the amount of size of some of our, our pesticide labels, and that is always going to be a good thing. But there's going to be some significant stuff here. They're also looking to make a requirement of searching for carcasses on the field use of rodenticides, you know, those areas where it's used in agriculture. People are going to have to do more grid searches just like they're doing presently with prairie dogs. I am unclear as to whether they're going to allow bait stations for prairie dogs. That I, I'm still, I not don't have a clear understanding on that. And I'll be interested in seeing what the EPA rules on that particular element. My suspicion is that they won't, but uh, we'll see if my gut is right on that. Well, again, this is the changes coming and some of these changes are good. Some of these changes, I think, for my opinion, is a little bit of overreach. And then I do wish the EPA would put more emphasis on enforcement because I am not convinced that putting up more road signs is going to change driver behavior. That's the analogy I'm using. And same way, I don't think a lot more restrictions on these labels is going to necessarily change enough human behavior for them to feel that they're making progress. If we're not working on enforcement, I don't know where all this is going to go. Well, you've been listening to Living the Wildlife Podcast. My name is Stephen Van Tassel. The presentation today has been on the part two of the proposed interim registration review decision for seven anticoagulant rodenticides published by the EPA in November 22. So this is not set in stone, but as I said, the concrete is hardening. Has your association commented and will it comment because we are in the comment period on this particular document. So if your organization is not commenting on it, why isn't it? And that may be something as you as a if you're spending money in your association, ask them, well, why aren't you just making a comment? Don't you want to protect my interests? And if you don't speak, your other voices are going to fill in the gap that would have been left for you. Well, again, I'm Stephen Van Tassel. You've been listening to Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Glad you joined us. Do do sign up for the uh, notifications for when we have the other other shows coming out. Also visit me on Rumble. You can go to Wildlife Control Consultant and you can look me up there. I post my podcasts up there as well. And of course, I'd always want to be hearing from you. It's at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com wildlife control consultant at gmail.com give me suggestions for future shows and comments and yes even criticisms so this is living the wildlife and why do we call it living the wildlife because we want you to live the wildlife not be the wildlife take care everybody